Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming out. I want to thank the Toronto Public Library as well for inviting me here. Um, I flew in uh, from Calgary last night on the red eye. And actually, bef before I start, I um, let's talk about an, something that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, I was doing an event in Burlington, Ontario, quite a few years ago, actually, um, uh, with Stuart McLean and uh, a fellow named Richard Buckman who wrote a book, Can We Be Good Without God? So I'd written Canadian history for dummies at that point. <laughs> so I was a professional dummy. I was the, there's a lot of amateur dummies, but I was a professional. And so that was the lineup. It was, so you had Stuart McLean, you had Canadian history for dummies, and can we be good without God? This is the lineup. And we were sitting on a kind of a raised platform, and the audience was looking at us. It was on a Sunday afternoon in Burlington. And Stuart leaned over, and he whispered to me. He said, uh, second row, first guy on the right. He goes, that's the guy. I said, what do you mean that's the guy? So that's the guy who's going to fall asleep. <laughs> so there's always one. And they always sit really close so you can see them. So here's what we do. We all, we all put in $20. And if he falls asleep when you're talking, you have to give the other two $10 each. So I was first, so I thought, well, I can't lose. I thought, this is, this is a, a Mills lock. I can, I can do this. So I got up and I said, Canadian history is a fascinating subject. And his head started to bob. He's, he's starting to nod off. And uh, actually, later I asked Stuart, how did you know that was the guy? And he said, well, Will, he said, what you look for is you look for an older, distinguished looking gentleman who's not talking to anybody, who is sitting beside a woman who's talking to everybody. <laughs> because that's his wife, and she's taken him there to improve him. So that's why he's there. So I was talking, and, uh, and this, this fellow was starting to fall asleep. So I started to kind of clap into my microphone. I would say, well, so that's why history really matters and it's, it's an important, and his head kind of jerked and, and I kept him awake. I just kept this one fellow awake through the whole, whole event. And then I sat down, Mr. Buckman got up and said, can we be good without God? And he was asleep. The guy was gone. He was, he was gone. And uh, the strange, the strange follow-up to that story is that after the event was over, Mr. Buckman got up and said, terribly sorry, I can't stay to do a signing or talk. I had to leave. He left. And Stuart looked at me and said, did he give you the money? <laughs> and I said, no, did he, did he give, give you the money? And I, I, I said, no. And he said, um, the man wrote a book on ethics. Okay, this time, uh, anyway, so I wanted to get that out there before we start. And, and uh, no pressure, sir, but there's money riding on you today, okay? There's money riding on you, just to let you know. Um, I, uh, I'm going to do, it's a very short talk today and a very short reading because I think we want to uh, do more question and answer. It's a, this is a good room for it. It's not dark and I'm not looking into lights and uh, I'm not on a raised platform or anything. So this is a great chance if you have questions or anything you want to talk about. So I'm going to try to do a, just a short reading and a short talk. Um, one of the questions, uh, other, other authors puzzle me. I'm, a, I'm I puzzled by other authors. I don't know why it is. And one of the things that authors, when they get together, they complain. Like any job, right? You get together and you complain. Um, and one thing that authors always complain about is that when they get interviewed or even in parties or, or an event like this, they say, oh, people always ask me, where do you get your ideas? It's such a dumb question. I don't know why that bothers them. I, I know where, like, I find it fascinating where ideas come from. Sometimes you don't really know. But I've written three novels. Um, and in each case, I, I can ex remember exactly where the idea for each one came. So I'll quickly tell you, just so you don't have to ask, ask that at the end. <laughs> uh, and um, and I, don't, I really don't know why that bothers authors so much. But just so you know, a lot of authors don't like it when you ask that. I, I don't know why. I don't, so if you don't like an author, ask that question. <laughs> If, if I meet an author or something, he's doing an event, I don't really like the guy. I'll say, where do you get your ideas from? Uh, my ver the ver I'd written, been writing history and, and humor and, and travel. I walked, she said, that was a good line, by the way, about how else do you walk across Northern Ireland except in the rain. Yeah. Um, but I switched to fiction uh, based on, on an offhand comment by a publicist, just a comment that she made. And publicists... Um, when they, when they send you on a book tour, so you have to go and do all these interviews and, and you're flying around, it's not at all glamorous. It's quite tiring and kind of strange. And they hire these uh, uh, educated young women, generally, to drive you around. And uh, they're called publicists. And they're there to make sure you don't get lost and wander off and make sure you actually show up. Um, 
And when you're doing a book tour, you often meet the same author again and again because there's, if they're touring the same time. So with one book, and I, I, th I think it may have been The Dummies, actually, um, there was a woman who wrote a self-help book. She wrote a book on how to connect with other people. And wherever I went, I would run into her again and again. She wrote a book on how to connect with other people. I met her four times in three days. She did not remember my name <laughs> one time. This is true. And I was so mad, I got in the car with the publicist and I said, that woman's driving me crazy. And, she, and uh, I said, she's, she's mad. And uh, she goes, yeah, well, self-help, you know, self-help authors have that reputation. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, why, why are there, s and there's so many of them. I said, why, why, are, why is self-help, why are there so many self-help books out there? And she said, now, I remember this, she said, the reason there's so many self-help books is because they don't work. I thought that was brilliant. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, if they work, there'd be one self-help book, right? You'd walk in, there you go, thank you, and you'd be done. So I started to think, well, what, hap what would happen if someone wrote a self-help book that actually worked, that allowed you to get financial security, improve your love life, uh, stop smoking, lose weight, uh, em empower your inner child, all that stuff. So I thought, well, it would be a disaster. It would be awful. The world would just grind to a halt. So that's where happiness, my, my first novel, came from that idea. And uh, the second does book, it work? does it work? <laughs> yes, happiness absolutely works. You should buy it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a sell, it's about a, it's about a self-help book that works and then ruins the world. It destroys the world. Um, and the second book came out of my dad. I had an older dad uh, who grew up in the Dust Bowl of Saskatchewan in the 60s, in the 30s, sorry. Um, and my father was suspiciously well-informed about con artists which was never explained to my satisfaction. And he used to tell us stories about guys like Henry the Horse and Suitcase Simpson who could switch suitcases. And so I always, always, always wanted to write a book about this golden age of con artists, uh, an education, a young man who gets educated as a con artist. And that's where Spanish Fly, which is my second novel, came from. While I was researching Spanish Fly, I was reading up about cons, different cons, scams, swindles, and I came across a reference to 419. And it said 419, and I, I was not interested at all. It didn't catch my attention because it's an email scam. You know, for, you know, I'm the son of an exiled Nigerian diplomat. I need help moving millions of dollars into your bank account. So I wasn't interested, but there was a footnote. So this 419 really starts with an asterisk because there was a footnote, and it said 419 is the modern variation of the Spanish prisoner swindle which goes back to the Elizabethan era. And now that got my attention. I thought, how can an email scam go back to the Elizabethan era? It actually goes back to the Spanish Armada. 15, someone will know, 88? Someone, yeah, so I knew somebody would know, 1588. Uh, and so even though England won uh, and defeated the Spaniards, uh, a lot of ships were, a lot of English noblemen drowned, disappeared, died. And in the wake of the Spanish Armada, um, Pen, not emails, obviously, but pen and ink letters began to circulate. And if you read them, they're eerily familiar. They say, dear sir, I am the daughter of an imprisoned English nobleman. We need just a little bit of money up front to bribe his evil Spanish uh, captors. And of course, you give a little bit of money, then you'll be rewarded, of course, because he's wealthy. But then wouldn't you know it, they, they get caught again, then they have to escape, then they have to pay for passage to England. Then oh, wouldn't you know there's more complications and more complications, and they, that's why it's called an advance fee fraud. The, the fraud is the, the money that you pay. They bleed you dry. So that's where 419 came out of. And my original idea was, my instincts are comedic, and my original idea was I thought, what if there really is this poor Nigerian <laughs> diplomat, nobody will take his money, he's got $65 million, no, these idiots won't take his money. Um, but that fizzled quite quickly, and I started to research it. And uh, the more I researched it, the darker it became. It's a very, very dark story and I came across a man, a story of a man who embezzled a bunch of money from his church, a pastor. He thought he was helping somebody, uh, embezzled the church, killed himself uh, over it. And I thought, well, this is, this is not funny in the least. And I, I found a story in England of a fellow who tried to kill himself by setting himself on fire and failed and didn't succeed, which in, in many ways is worse, I think. Uh, so the, I started to read about the victims, and then I got interested in Nigeria, and I thought, well, what's the other side of the story? What's the other side of the mirror? Um, and that's how 419 kind of took shape. 
And uh, people often say it's a progression, not a progression, uh, digression or, or a departure. But I'm going to argue today that it's not. I'm going to give you two, two short readings to illustrate this, because I think as authors, certain themes obsess you or fascinate you or grip you. Certain you keep returning, not necessarily to the same topic, but to the same themes. So I'm just going to do a quick reading, uh, one from um, Canadian Pie, which is a, an anthology of my humor writing and travel writing. And then I'm going to read from a short passage from 419. Uh, Canadian Pie is kind of, it includes the very first thing I ever wrote which was a travel article in 1995 when I was living in Japan, right up to the um, Olympics. Do you remember the closing ceremonies, the, the Vancouver? Yeah, I was, I was the head writer on, on those. So you remember the giant beavers and the dancing and uh, voyageurs? And remember uh, Shalom Shatner? Yeah. In my defense, OK? <laughs> Let's be clear on this. In my defense, uh, as I discovered, uh, there are the words that you, there, there's what you write for William Shatner, and then there are the words that he actually speaks. <laughs> and there's really only a coincidental relationship between, between those. And they, and it's a very different process. They vetted it, and then they punched it up, and they, um, they at one point they brought in uh, a guy from the Jay Leno show to punch up my material for me. So it was very, by the time it was done, I barely recognized it. Uh, although I did get a great date night, because I flew my wife and I out to Vancouver for the for the ceremonies, and uh, as a writer, I had nothing to do. I just watched. Uh, the performers were coming and going, and the producers were getting all nervous. Um, and I was sitting across, actually, there was a, the VIP booth was about from here to you, and uh, it was jutting out, and it was Harper was there, and the, the chiefs from the First Nations. And I was watching, and I looked over, and I thought, because they're giving us snacks, it's like a private booth, and, and they had peanuts there. <laughs> So I was looking over, and I said to my wife, and she's been, we've been married almost 20 years, I said, you know, and she said, don't even think about it. <laughs> I said, I didn't say anything, I said, don't even, I said, no, I was just saying that, I bet I, if I, I could, like, not for a political reason, just to, you know, I would throw, and then I would look away, is what I would do. But I thought I could just throw peanuts at him all night. Um, anyway, which is, I made a career out of doing that, actually. Uh, so the, uh, Canadian Pie includes uh, my original scripts. So if you ever get a chance for it in the library, uh, um, you can see what the original scripts were. They're very different than what you saw. So this is me getting the last word. But today I'm going to read a, um, a passage about uh, reading the Hardy Boys to my son, Alex. I was going to drink a water. <clears throat> I've been reading the Hardy Boys books to my son. Alex was eight when we started. He's 10 now. There are approximately 98,000 books in the series. So by the time we finish, I figure he'll be reading them to me. Aside from their classic literary stylings, and this is an actual quote from volume 10, What Happened at Midnight. Okay. I'm awfully sorry, Chet said apologetically. <laughs> Let's just take a moment and really appreciate the fine writing. I'm awfully sorry, Chet said. How? How did you? Apologetically. OK. The Hardy Boys books, like all great literature, raise more questions than they answer. Questions such as, what is it about the town of Bayport that attracts smugglers so much? It's often commented upon that in the world of the Hardy Boys, the worst one has to face is illegal importers lurking in the shadows, ready to evade regulatory government tariffs at a moment's notice, usually with a hearty laugh, head tossed back, fist on hips. There are no financial meltdowns, no random terrorist attacks, no West Nile mosquitoes, no home invasions, no environmental carcinogens, no gang swarmings, just smugglers. <laughs> Less commented upon is the intelligence of said smugglers, especially as, mark this, they always get caught. You would think their word would have gotten out by now. You'd think there's got to be some sort of smuggler's grapevine. But psst, whatever you do, avoid Bayport. Pass it on. <laughs> Equally odd is how Frank and Joe Hardy are always rubbing their jaws and trying to figure out what's going on this time around. All these mysterious comings and goings, what could it possibly mean? Smugglers, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> you would think by now, every time a scowling man in an overcoat sh shouldered past them on the street, Frank and Joe would look at each other, nod, and say, smuggler, we better nab him now. <laughs> My son Alex had this figured out by the third book. I bet it's the stranger who pushed past them on the street, he'd say, <laughs> breathlessly at first, and then with less vim, 
on each passing tale. Reading the Hardy Boys as an adult is very different from reading them when you're 10. As a 10-year-old, you say, hooray, Mr. Hardy is away again. Frank and Joe will have to solve the case on their own again. Whereas, as an adult, you find yourself wondering about Mr. and Mrs. Hardy's marriage. I'm trying to think, maybe there's a reason Detective Hardy is always out of town on business. For Alex, that doesn't matter. For Alex, the Hardy boys are all about possibility. The possibility of adventure hidden in the day-to-day -day details of life. When you're 10 years old, life is an open promise. It's an age where astronaut, archaeologist, cartoonist is still a viable career path. The past is so small, the future is so overwhelmingly large when you are 10. I remember Alex at age four, rummaging through the leaves, searching for lost treasure. These would be leaves that I had just raked 10 minutes before. <laughs> and there's me, in spite of myself, hoping maybe he'd find some. Or Alex at age three, sitting on my lap as I read him a story about a little boy who makes friends with a duck. Now the little boy visits the duck every morning at the pond. And one day the little boy gets sick and doesn't show up. So the duck leaves the pond and comes to the boy's house and goes up the stairs to the boy's room to cheer him up. Alex became very quiet. When I asked him what was wrong, he said, how come in storybooks, ducks and little boys are friends? But when we go to the park and I try to say hi to the ducks, they just run away. Why? You want to know why? Because life doesn't work that way. Because there are no little friendly ducks who come to visit you when you're sick. There are no smugglers lurking in the coves. There is no treasure hidden in the leaf pile, except maybe what the neighbor's cat has left. But that's not what I tell him, is it? That's not what I said. What I said was, well, I think the ducks in the park are a little shy. How about some ice cream? You want some ice cream? As a father, one of the hardest burdens you have to bear is the wonderfully heartfelt and wholly unjustified faith your children invest in you. The teenage years are coming, sure enough, and with them the inevitable discovery that far from being a paragon of manly perfection, I am in fact little more than a walking compilation of flaws and foibles, but not now, not yet. When I took Alex to the Calgary Stampede, he was five years old and wearing a hat with a plastic whistle. I wanted my son to see the bull riders and the chuck wagon races. I hadn't thought about the calf roping. By the time the second calf had been yanked off its feet and tied down, Alex was in tears. He said, make them stop. Daddy, make them stop. It's a burden and it's a glory being a dad. It's the one time in your life when someone really believes in you. They really believe that you can stand up in the middle of a grandstand filled with 20,000 people and say loudly and firmly, in the same manner as you'd announce, it's time for bed and no more dilly-dallying. He believes that you can stand up and say, this has to stop right now. I'm sorry, but I'm the dad and you have to stop hurting those little cows. But I can't. I can't stop it any more than I can stop the pain from coming or the heartaches or the darkness from falling or the sadder truths from dawning. All I can do, I suppose, is make the landing a little softer. Thanks. And now I'm just going to read, just as to compare and contrast. Um, I'm just going to read the opening page, page of the book. So this is 419, and actually, for, does everyone kind of know this story? It's about a man who, um, her father, a uh, woman, sorry, her father gets caught up in a, in a 419 scam. And um, uh, she decides to track down the people she thinks is responsible for his death. So this is uh, the, just the opening page and a half of 419. And as, you, as I read it, you'll con I, I think you'll see the connection between a humor column on the Hardy Boys and the novel 419. I think there's, I don't, myself, although the style and the tone may be differently, I, I think it's clearly the same author and the same, the same concerns. Would you die for your child? This is the only question a parent really needs to answer. Everything else flows from this. In the kiln-baked emptiness of thorn bush deserts, in mangrove swamps and alpine woods, in city streets and snowfalls, it is the only question that needs answering. The boy's father 
knee-deep in warm mud, was pulling hard on fishing nets that were splashing with life, mist on green waters, sunlight on tidal pools. Chapter 1. A car falling through darkness, end over end, one shuddering thud following another, fountains of glass showering outward and then a vacuum of silence collapsing back in. The vehicle came to rest on its back at the bottom of an embankment below the bridge, propped up against a splintered stand of poplar trees. You could see the path it had taken through the snow, leaving a churned trail of mulch and wet leaves in its wake. And then, into the scentless winter air, the seeping odor of radiator fluid, of gasoline. They climbed down on grappling lines, leaning into their descent, the lights of the fire trucks and ambulances washing the scene in alternating reds and blues, throwing shadows first one way and then the next, countless constellations in the snow, glass catching the light. When the emergency team finally arrived at the bottom of the embankment, they were out of breath. Within the folded metal of the vehicle, a buckled dashboard, a bent steering wheel, more glass, and in the middle, something that had once been a man. White hair, wet against the skull, matted now in a thick red mud. Sir, can you hear me? His lips were moving as the life poured out of him to wherever it is that life goes. Sir, but no words came out, only bubbles. Thanks. One of the questions that they ask you is, do you write for yourself or do you write for other people? This is a question. Who do you write for? Um, and I think the answer, I don't, I don't think we really have a choice. I don't think authors, if they're honest, really have a choice or, or should have a choice, I should say. Um, I think what you write, what you write about, you write for yourself. It's the things that hold you. We all have things that, that, that grab us and hold us. How you write is for the reader. This is my, my rule of thumb, is that what I write about is for me. How I write it is for you, is for the reader. Because you have to convey that to the reader, and you have to always keep the reader in mind. Uh, if you reverse it, uh, it can easily become very self-indulgent or esoteric. If you reverse the order, if, you, if how you write it is for yourself, and, or, or so if, if how you write it is for yourself, you, it's very easy to become um, either self-indulgent or esoteric. If what you write is for the audience, you become, um, you, you, you're on the brink of selling out, of writing stuff purely for the market, being market-driven. And a lot of authors do a very good, have, earn a very good living doing that. So you can write what, what, you can decide, I'm going to, what I'm going to write about is for the market. I don't do that myself. I think I'm going to open it up for questions then. I think, like I said, I'll keep the, the, that part of the, uh, the afternoon kind of short. So if people have, uh, have any questions other than where do you get your ideas from? <laughs> I had one guy do that one. It's a smart ass guy. So, excuse me, where do you get your ideas? Uh, so please don't do that. Um, but any other questions? Yes? That's okay. What uh, are there? Is there a typical profile or two or three profiles of those people in North America who do actually get fished into these scams? There is. There is very much. There is. He's. Uh, could everyone ask? Do you want me to repeat his question? Could you hear? So he was asking me, "How did you get so good looking?" <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm summarizing, right? Yeah. I'm summarizing. No, he, no. He is. Uh, he's. Uh, he was asking uh, if there's a profile of, uh, of a, a, a kind of a classic victim uh, in 409, and actually there is. And Henry, the father, is based on a kind of profile. Um, um, this very common, it's often a retired, it's often seniors, retired. Um, often, I don't, I mean, I can, I can guess why, but often it's people involved in um, like churches, pastors, people who have uh, a member of a small community who have access to funds, no one's really, there's no real monitoring or auditing. Um, a retired shop teacher would be a classic profile of a, of a victim. Uh, they often target seniors. Is your, is your husband a retired shop? <laughs> Actually, um, I, it's great to, to know that because I've got this, uh, I'm sitting on $60 million. And uh, I want to put it in your bank account. Uh, <laughs> um, but that actually, uh, and what, what, what happens is, um, oh, actually, are, do you, have you read the book? Uh, I just started it. 
starting it. I was going to ask you if it's accurate how he portrays being a retired shopkeeper, because <laughs> I'm not a retired shopkeeper. So, uh, but uh, the, the reason they target seniors, and the reason they do that is seniors tend to be um, more trusting. They tend to be from a, a, they don't slam the phone and hang up when you start, because they do pester you with phone calls too. That's what people don't realize. It starts on the internet, but it moves into the phone very quickly. Um, they badger you, and uh, they tend to have you sitting on savings. They tend to own their own home which they, they, they will steal your home. They will take your home because they will, they, they will run you into the ground and then what they do is they throw you a lifeline. At the very last moment, just when you can't take it anymore, they say, look, we've cleared it all up. Here's a check for, uh, so you, he's pumped in $40,000. Here's a check for 100000 Take out 50, pass the other 50 back. And of course, it's a forged check. And people don't realize that clearing a check doesn't mean the check is real. If your bank clears a check, what that means is they can get the money from you. That means that you, they've looked, and yes, if this check is bad, we can get the money back. That's what clearing a check means. It doesn't mean that they've, they're not criminal investigators. They don't go in and say, this is, oh, this is a real check. And um, they often will put errors in the, in the tracking codes on those checks so that they take a while to, because eventually they do get caught. This is a fake check. And they'll, they'll do errors in there so that they know it gets held up at some clearing house and then gets moved to another office, and that, someone has to sign off on it, so they drag it out. And what happens is, of course, now you're in the, in the hawk for $50,000, and you, you'll end up taking out a second mortgage in your house or, a, or remortgaging your house. So they do tend to target seniors. Uh, so if you have a, a relative who mentions something or is excited about something on the Internet, then be really aware, be really, really aware of that. Now, it can happen to anyone. One of the most harrowing accounts was a young engineering student in the UK who got taken for everything. I read his, he wrote a book about it. And he was a young tech savvy guy. So they're, they're, most of them are tech savvy. What happens, is even if you click on that email and say, leave me alone, or you've got the wrong guy, well, then they've jumped. Because today, it's very, very easy to create a profile of you. I could probably find anyone here, and if I got your name, and knew just a little bit about you, I could put together a profile. And I've, I saw emails. The emails in the book are cut and pasted from real case studies that the police gave me. And even like the, the one where one guy got taken in because he was a fellow bird watcher. He got an email, I'm a bird watcher too. I've always, you know, I've always wanted to see the, whatever it is, red-breasted sapsucker in South Carolina too. And then they, had, they built up this relationship on bird watching with this an older fellow. Of course, he was just Googling birds and agreeing with whatever he said. And then when you know it, he had an accident. He was in Indonesia and he had to send the money right away. And anyway, so there is, unfortunately, Henry is very, very typical. He's a very typical case. Well, he's, yeah, he's asking, uh, how do I, do I create a, a through line, uh, a plot through line for each character? Like, how do I develop the plot? And uh, it's a good question because plot is really undervalued. I don't know why. I go to creative writing classes, they always talk about create character development and themes, but plot is so crucial. That's the skeleton that you hang the story on. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, I, I spent, I, I, my background uh, was originally, what I studied in university was screenwriting. So they, the, and screenwriting is so disciplined, it's so unforgiving, and it's all about structure. Uh, it's structure and dialogue, and you, you don't, you can't, you can't, it's so, the structure is so set, it's like writing a sonnet in poetry. You can't fake it, you can't argue your way out of a, you can't write a one-line sonnet, and you can't write, you know, a 50-page sonnet. There's structure and form you have to conform to. Um, so I outline, I have colored uh, stuff, habits I picked up in, in, in film school, so I, I have index cards, so Laura is like a light green and Namdi is blue, and then I write out their stories. I wrote all their stories separately, and then then kind of uh, or outline them. It was an 80, I should have brought it today, actually. It's an 85-page outline that I did. I, I spend more time outlining a book than writing it. The reason is, uh, one, it's, uh, that's the cure for writer's block, by the way, if you're wondering. Writer's block is jumping in when, you're not, when you don't really have an idea where you're going. So I, there were days, there's often days where I don't want to write. Almost every second day, actually. But uh, I sit down, and when, especially in the middle of a book, and you're like, oh. so you flip it open. Well, where am I? Oh, this is the scene where Namdi's father falls in the, in the swamp and goes blind. Uh, if I don't want to read it, I can skip ahead. But usually I try to write. I kind of try to stick to it. But I'll write it, and I might not even do a good job. But it's there on the page. I, I don't, and then I'm done. 
You know, I figure I'll have to do that scene today. And some days if I really don't feel like writing, I'll skip ahead and look for a really short scene. And I'll write, like, you know, this little one. Every time you see a chapter that's one paragraph, those are the day that I really <laughs> didn't want to write. Um, so I do, I structure it out and I lay it out all over the, the floor. My wife thinks I'm crazy. She comes home and goes, oh, this again. Because it'll be all over and I'll have, because you don't want a bunch of blue and you try to, and you look, you just look, kind of free associate. So if, if um, the police officer, the, the officer is looking at the bridges that lead into Calgary, well, then you can use that visually to go to the bridges into Lagos, into the city, that type of thing. So you look for, if Laura's mentioning her dad, and the, the images come out of that. You don't start with the motifs and the images. So as I was writing, Namdi's father was a storyteller. So I thought, well, I should have a scene where Laura's father tells her a story. So he tells her about Rapunzel. I don't know if you remember that. She tells her the story of Rapunzel. And Laura says, why didn't she just climb down? Why didn't she tie her hair and climb down and cut off her hair and run away? And I, that's great. You reveal the character and you also, so now you have an image of towers. And I realized Laura lives in a tower. She's Rapunzel. I just, it was right there in front of me. I didn't realize. So Laura is the girl in the tower. Um, and Brisboy is the prince who, she doesn't need rescuing, but he's, he wants to rescue someone who doesn't need rescuing. Poor guy. I know that feeling. <laughs> Every man knows that feeling. Um, <laughs> So the images come out of the plot, what I'm getting at is so, and then, so now when she's in Lagos and she's looking out the window, you add towers. So she's looking at the tower, the search, and it becomes a searchlight. She's looking at the airport tower, remember? And she's, there's, it's just an image. It's not like a key plot point, but that came out of, now I, now I recognize that there's a tower, that Laura's tied with towers and, and being alone in a tower. So I, I, I will go back and when you're rewriting, you add that. So I think plot is primary. I really believe that, that theme and stuff comes out of the plot and you don't get writer's block. It's, uh, um, but it's evolving. It isn't oh, no, yeah, you keep moving it around constantly. Yeah, yeah. And you go back and rewrite stuff. Like, for example, near the end, I went back. Uh, I went way back and added the scene where the 20, I don't know, I don't know how many people have read it, but you know the $20, she's at the stampede. Um, my editor kept saying, Will, you haven't signaled. Because uh, I thought it was clear with the, you know, let justice be done, though the heavens fall, that Laura Belie has this really rigid actually limited, she doesn't think so, but limited view of what justice is. Laura has this image. And my editor said, you haven't set that up, Will. You haven't set that up. So this is near the second draft of the book, or third, way late. In the, I said, well, what can I do? Anytime you're trying to solve a problem, if you can solve more than one problem at the same time, that's good writing. If you can solve, so I thought, not only will I s explain that, I'll show a relationship with her dad. I'll also reveal her dad. So the scene with the $20, um, for those who don't know it, she, she, she's in the Calgary Stampede. And uh, they're standing in line for the donuts. And she finds $20. And she tells her dad. And her dad makes her go down the line and ask everybody, did you lose $20? Did you lose $20? And some teenagers go, yeah, that's ours. <laughs> Thanks. And it's obviously not theirs. And it really bothers her. And she says, that wasn't their money. And he says, probably not. But it definitely wasn't ours. And so in his mind, the difference between probably and definitely. Um, so that, that's something that came out later. That's a plot point that I added much, much later. Uh, so yeah, you evolve, you don't, it's not rigid, but you do, I do lay it all out on the, like I said, when my wife comes home, she always, she hates that site, and I put it on the walls, and I try to look, you know, try to alternate the, the characters. 409 was really tough because of the plot, because it was really four stories that went like this, and it was really, really tough. Yeah. Well, just coming off that comment, that's, um, and, and what you said earlier about how you write is for the reader, one of the things I loved so much about this was the way you had these separate characters and their stories all came together to really make a point about the global politics yeah. of oil. And, and it was much better than any kind of didactic lesson about... No, you don't want to preach. You don't want to preach. Oil. You know, like yeah. these, it, it was just, I loved that about the book, was the way the, pe the people's lives Yeah, that was, and, gr and living in Calgary, you're very much aware of that as well. So, so no, she's talking about, about the way the, the, the characters interconnect, the stories interconnect, and, uh, um, uh, well, thank you for that. It was a lot of work, and, and I mean, Laura's a copy editor, and she talks about how life is, she's trying to sort out life. So the book starts very fragmented, uh, uh, and it's kind of funny. The one thing I find um, is I've had people say to me, well, I, it was strange. I didn't know how these stories were going to connect. But I thought, well, trust the author. He put it in for a reason. I was kind of buzzed. Like, clearly, if we jump from Calgary to a woman in the desert, there's a reason. And surely, 
and the idea is that these lives are, we, the idea is as a reader you think, well, what is the connection between someone in the Delta, this boy in the Delta, in this oil ruins landscape, this woman from the, the Sahel, this kid, well, what's the connection? And that's kind of the point. These lives are incredibly connected. They're, 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 um, they're directly connected and they all come together in that. So, I mean, give the, give the author some faith, put faith in the author that he's, there is a reason why we're in the Delta now and not in Calgary. There was someone in the back, yeah, and then I'll get some writing help. She's asking about the sense of place. Um, travel, writing is, travel writing and screenwriting are great disciplines for, towards fiction. Uh, travel writing, you have to be aware, you know, you're, you're constantly aware of the place. You know, you're evoking a sense of place through description, trying to f look for that telling detail. You know, you're not, um, travel writing is great for that. It teaches you, um, when I, I, was at, I was at Mount Royal University just doing guest course, just a guest lecture. And I told the students there, I said, you know, description is not about, you're not explaining a scene. You're evoking it. You're making that person feel, hopefully, what you feel. Um, if you're writing description and it feels like you're describing a photograph, that's bad writing. If you go, like, for example, this room, you wouldn't say, well, there was two doors on one side and the windows faced left. There was a podium. No, that doesn't matter. That's a photograph. You want to explain the, the energy of the room, the feel of the room, and uh, you take a checklist of the senses. When you're travel writing, you're always check, doing a checklist of, of your senses. The smell, the sight, what's hitting you first. What are people doing? As a travel writing, I'm always amazed when I read travel writing where it's looked like it's empty. They're in the piazza in Italy and they explain the architecture. So well, there's no one there, it was empty. <laughs> you were there on the, so travel writing is, it really came in handy. It is fiction though. This isn't a book, of, this isn't a travel book about Nigeria. Um, and uh, there's, uh, so far we've isolated two errors. I'm quite proud, there's two mistakes in the book. Those are not water buffalo, those are African buffalo. Thank you, I got lots of emails about that. If, you, if, if one of you read me that email, thank you, I know now. Because they, they were called buffalo. But I've been in Okinawa and I've seen them, these big huge, you know, the, and they're water buffalo. And I saw a photo of what was in Nigeria and I assumed that was a water buffalo, it's an African buffalo. So that type of thing. And uh, also there is, by the way, for any of the gentlemen in the audience, there is, I do know there is no such thing as a Pontiac Oldsmobile. Please stop writing me emails. <laughs> We fixed it. We fixed it in the paperback. Uh, we fixed just to quickly, and it's and it and it's all men. I have not received a single email or letter from a woman saying, because if, even if they know, they don't really care. Uh, but so uh, the first the first notice I got about that, I thought, well, that really. And I I, were, I did research with the police officers. I went around with uh, collision reconstruction officers in Calgary, and they were it was great. It was like being a little boy, like driving around with the police. It was the best day ever. I drove around, and we looked, drove around looking for a place we could kill somebody. They, they, they were looking, because they were trying to find, um, and actually, I'll just, uh, it, it was fascinating for me because they're empirical minded, these collision reconstruction. And I will get to the Pontiac, I just, this ties in. Uh, they look at a, an accident scene, just a mangle of metal, and then they un, in their mind, they unwrap it. They kind of go back, and they're in, completely fact-oriented these guys, and they're brilliant what they do. Um, and they asked me, I said, well, I, I talked to them, I said, I want an accident where this guy dies and it looks like an accident, but there has to be something. And they told me what they looked for, by the way. That second set of tire tracks, that was from the police. That actually happened. That happened once. So, I mean, I, I don't know anything about collision reconstruction or police investigation. So um, they said, well, where was the accident? I said, I don't know, like a, <clears throat> like a road with like maybe an embankment. And they said, no, where was the accident? What was the address? I said, well, I don't know, like a hill? They said, no, what hill? I'm like, well, like, it could be like maybe a curve. Like, what curve? Where's the place? So we drove around Calgary, and we ended up on Ogden Road. That's a real place in the book. That's a, you can stand there and see exactly what they see. And um, it's Ogden Road, comes on the 50th. There's a sharp corner, and they said, you know, if the car just missed the guardrail, he would go over, and they would say, they, they argued like it would turn two or three times. And in the book, he goes two, maybe three times. That's why. <laughs> so I was covering my bases, because so one guy said, no, it would flip. It would hit over end. Um, and as we were standing there, actually, it was a blistery day in January, this car came flying down and fishtailed. And the cops go, ah, oh. ah, oh. oh. They said, you almost got lucky. That's what he said, you almost got lucky. But anyway, in my interviews, I asked them, what would an, uh, like, so they said, who's, who's the victim? I said, well, it's an older retired fellow. And he says, oh, so driving a big car. And he said, Pontiac, comma, Oldsmobile, meaning comp, Pontiac or, or, I don't know anything about cars. So I transcribed my notes. I have them transcribed for me because I don't type very well. So they were transcribed and it comes back as, she didn't hear the comma either. It comes back as, 
you know, me asking, what type of car would he drive? Oh, Pontiac Oldsmobile. So not knowing that's like saying a Toyota Honda. He was driving a Toyota Honda, a famous Toyota Honda. So, um, so it's now changed to an Oldsmobile Cutlass. Thank you. Uh, so please stop sending me emails about that. I do know, uh, I do know now that Pontiac and Olds, there's no such thing as a Pontiac Olds. And I, I, I was interested if I, when you uh, read the opening part of the book, that, that was a part that interested me throughout the whole idea of what a parent would do for a child. And it was very clear to me in the case of the character of Mandy that what a parent would do for a child and would you die for a child, would you kill for a child. Can you talk mm -hmm. about the other parent-child relationships and where you saw sure. that? working there? Well, my editor, first of all, my editor pointed out to me that all the dads die in this book. She thought that was very cruel. All the, they're all, the nicest people die. I have to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it yet, but she said, couldn't you have killed one of the, like, a-holes? Couldn't you have killed one of those guys? But, but unfortunately, in, in life, it's the Namdis of the world who die. It's not the Winstons. The Winstons survive. The Warrens, her brother, Warren and Winston, they're kind of mirror images. They survive. Those people, they do okay. It's the Namdis who don't. And the question, yeah, would you die for your child? Because, uh, and I'm assuming women lie too. I don't know. Maybe not. But men lie. We lie all. Oh, I would die for you, honey. I, well, you would not die for your wife. You wouldn't die for. You say that. Oh, I would die. But you would die for your child. That's the only person that. And that's that's amazing, huge uh, epiphany when that hits you. That you would actually die for this person, this little person. You would die for them. That's an amazing thing. And and I don't know. And like I said, we because we say that to our spouses. Yes, I would die for you, honey. I would die for you. And there are cases where you know in the pinch. But. Uh, <laughs> And maybe I would. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't, I shouldn't say I wouldn't. I don't know. I shouldn't say I wouldn't. I might. I don't know. But definitely with my kids, I would. But then I thought, well, that's, that, what's the, the harder question is, would you kill for your child? So that's good. Let's take it up a notch. Would you kill for your child? And that's what Namdi has to face, right? Would you kill for, for your child? So the book is about you know, parents, and it's about fathers specifically uh, in the book. Fathers figure very big. Namdi's father, um, uh, Laura's father. Right. What about Winston? Oh, Winston's parents. Well, uh, one thing, I, I, actually, that came out of an interesting thing is that uh, I didn't want a Nigeria, I didn't want, I wanted to present middle class, upper, upper middle class Nigerians because they live on Victoria Island. They're very well to do, they're very Anglo, Anglophiles. Uh, so I put them in there. And uh, no, Winston's father was, um, I never thought of him as a major character. Uh, that was my favorite scene to write, by the way, the dinner scene. Yeah. I like that because in one of the other rules in screenwriting, they tell you is uh, if a dialogue, if, if dialogue is about what it's about, you're in trouble. That's bad dialogue if it's on the nose. If someone, if, if you want to show that this person resents this person and this person always loved this person and that person says, I've, I resent you and he says, I've always loved you, that's bad writing. That's called on the nose writing and it's not good. So if, if the dialogue is about what it's about, that's not good. So why I enjoy that scene is on the surface, they're just talking. But there's all these agendas underneath. Her mom's trying to marry Laura off. Laura's sparring. Laura's slowly tightening the noose on Winston. And about halfway, he starts to get a tingle that something's wrong. And you realize that the, the power has shifted. And I don't know why what this says about me, but I love those moments when a power shifts. Uh, for people who've read um, Happiness. I don't know, has anyone read Happiness? So you read, do you remember at the end with the trailer, he goes in with the young guy, goes in with the old man? Yeah. I thought of that as a boxing match. The first, Edwin lost the first round. He went outside, remember, and he comes back in. It's an old guy in a, in a, in a trailer park, and it's a, it's a battle of wills. And when he realizes there's nowhere to spend the money in this town, all the power just shifts. He comes back in, he goes, where's the money? Remember, he comes in, and he, I spent it, I blew it all, I didn't care. Spent it on women and wine. He says, no, you didn't. Where's the money? Like, he knows there's something more. And I love those moments when everything shifts, when the power shifts from one character to another. And that's what happens during that dinner, is that it shifts to Laura. Are we we're up till 1.30, is it? I, I want to make sure. I don't want to, am I late? Am I over already or not? Okay, no, we got lots of questions. I'm just, the lady here and the lady here. We'll start, we'll start here. We'll start here, I think. Yes. Yeah? Well, I just wanted to ask you the second most obnoxious question that we've been asking. And that is, <laughs> what country are you getting interested now? Oh, I'm going to Rwanda in, in uh, she's asking where I'm going next. Uh, it's a travel memoir. I try to switch between fiction and travel. Uh, so I've, so in, there was a, the, the anthology in between, and there was a, little, a Christmas book I did, but generally I do, the big projects are, so, um, you know, Beyond Belfast, uh, no, so Happiness, uh, then Beyond Belfast, and then Spanish Fly, and then Beauty Tips from Moostra, I think, and then, so I go back and forth. 
So the next book is a travel memoir uh, based in Rwanda. I'm going to uh, Rwanda with a friend of mine who his family uh, got wiped out in the genocide. So, um, but we're going to write a fun book about Rwanda. We're going to get a <laughs> we're going to get a big SUV. It's called Road Trip Rwanda. It's going to be we're going to and and uh, we're not going to bring in the wives. We're going to go. Uh, it's going to be him and me uh, driving around, and the mountain gorillas are there. You know where Diane Fossey, uh, Diane Fossey, yeah, uh, was there. And I think the, this lady here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. She was saying that she found the, the, the picture of the politics of the oil industry in Nigeria. Well, that was something I didn't know about until I started writing it, and I was just horrified. I was just mortified. Uh, I think, uh, the, who was next? In the back? Was it? Hi. Yes. Uh, Katimovic, Katimovic, yes, fellow Katimovic. Katimovic was a youth volunteer program. Uh, going through Katimovic is like being going to Vietnam. You see other like veterans, like, I was in Nam too, man. I was <laughs> representing. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. What were you, like, you guys are out of control. <laughs> That's like a code about what, sorry, I should explain. She's talking about what her group uh, did, which makes my group look. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a book I wrote. It's out of print now. It's called I Was a Teenage Katima Victim. That's like initial, that's like that's your initial book of yours. Everyone who reads your books who's from Katima Victim, that's your like, initiation from your book. It's so many people start with that book. It's yeah. funny. Um, it's like the gateway drug to my books. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Would yeah. you like, push them and make them have their own be Katima victims? I don't, I don't know if I'd push, but I would certainly encourage. My niece went on it. My niece was on the last Katima victim before it got oh, cut. Sure. She was on the last program. She was a star because I was her uncle. Uh, <laughs> they all had the book. Um, uh, so, no, I, I would have definitely put my kid in Katima Vic. Katima Vic, I should explain, that was based on my journals. And I, as over time, as I wrote when I was 19, and over time, I kind of put rose colored glasses on. And uh, then I went back to my original journals and I realized how. Mad I was all the time and all the conflicts that were there. I'd forgotten about that. So when I went to write it, I decided, are you going to be honest? Or like how I remember it is much more positive than being in there. So. You know, I was just rereading parts of it last night and I was just cracking up because I was like, we could compare notes because I kept a journal of it too. And it was, yeah. So my other question is um, I read uh, books like Happiness and um, I read uh, Spanish Fly. So how do, you, how do you think you've evolved from your earlier work? Well, I'll give you a short answer because I think we're, uh, I'll give you the short answer. How have I evolved uh, from the earlier writing on? This, this is a strange thing to say, but when you start out, um, uh, I mean, it's a craft. So hopefully I'm getting better every book. Hopefully, I mean, you try to hone your craft. You try to, every book, try to you know, improve what you're doing. I'm still not where I want to be. I'm still like, every time you start out with a book, you have the idea and it's never quite as good, not quite what you wanted it to be. Um, but when you start out early on, you have this weird mix of arrogance and insecurity. It's a very strange mix. So you know, my writing is, no, don't, don't muck about with my writing. Don't edit it. You won't, you won't brook any editorial changes or, or suggestions. And yet you're also very insecure about it. And as I go on, I become more confident about my writing, but I've also become more open about changing it. So uh, I think it's more a personal evolution that, than, than an artistic. I'm not sure. I think there's one more question. Do we have time? Okay. Or is it 1.30? Okay. Is that we're done? Because I saw you slowly come out, so I'll just, yes. She's, she's been waiting, she's been waiting and waiting. No, I'm just always interested. What, I'd like to know who you, who are some of your favorite writers, fiction wise. So she's asking what my favorite authors are. Well, yeah. uh, I, read a, I read way more nonfiction than I do fiction, I should confess, uh, first of all. Uh, there, there, there's, I'll, I'll quickly answer, I'll answer this very quickly, I, uh, but there's actually, there's two ways to answer that. There's two, there's authors that you like and authors that influence you. And it's a little different. Authors you like? Uh, authors, I like Milan Kundera a lot. 
but he hasn't influenced me, I don't think. I don't see a lot of Milan Kundera in my books. I love Milan Kundera, you know, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. His later stuff got a little bit, he needed an editor and later. <laughs> like his slowness, I just was, that was aptly named book, slowness. Um, but uh, then there's the writers that influence you, like Pierre Burton or Bill Bryson, uh, who I also admire. But there's books you admire and that, that you, you try to emulate, and there's books that you just admire. And probably the one single book, I'll end this book, because it's a book that no one knows about. It's the one book that influenced Katima Victim and has influenced me more than any other stylistically. It's called Red Sky at Morning by Richard Bradford. Red Sky at Morning, it's brilliant. And if you read it, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. This is because you'll see how, especially my early writing, how much he influenced me. Richard Bradford, he only ever wrote two books, but Red Sky at Morning. And we'll end there. Thanks so much.